All right, I'm all, I'm all mic'd up. All right, cool. Um, I have the bingo card with me. For anybody that doesn't have bingo, I've made it my goal. Well, I don't care. It's like bragging rights at this point. <laughs> bragging rights. There's no prizes, but you know, just the glory of a filled out bingo card. I'm going to try to hit as many bingo terms as I possibly can during this one presentation. So we'll see if I can pack it in or not. Um, this presentation is a version, or basically the same version. Of, oh, yeah. Somebody can keep track if they have an empty bingo card, you know, how many terms I hit. But um, yeah, I've got mine up here. All right, super exciting. Um, so Jeremy gave this presentation at the ALA annual conference, and um, I'm going to re-deliver it to you guys. So hopefully none of you saw Jeremy speak, and this will all be like incredibly new and fabulous information. Um, what I'm going to talk about is the Western Name Authority file, and this is a grant-funded project um, where we received a grant um, from IMLS to pilot a system for developing a regional authority file, meaning things containing authority records um, <laughs> or information about names and corporate bodies that we might find in our digital collections. So we'll give an update on what we've done so far and what we're thinking um, about doing moving forward. So, um, why is this an issue? As anybody knows who's worked on large-scale digitization projects, <laughs> as your metadata gets aggregated, um, <laughs> mistakes emerge um, even more than you might see in just a local collection um, or a local repository. So here, um, we, we took Charles Savage as very much um, this project's mascot. He's a very well-known photographer of the American West. And with great shame, you know, we noticed our metadata as it is, as is it in, in MWDL and DPLA, all of these different um, name variants. So before we started on this project, we counted around 40 different variations of his name in MWDL. Um, that's kind of that's kind of terrible. Um, one thing that most people face in their dams or digital asset management systems um, is that often you don't have really good methods for um, authority control in them, especially perhaps in systems such as Content DM. Um, if you're in um, a Samvera or maybe an Islandora repository, there might be some other modules. Um, if you're using Dublin Core mods or qualified Dublin Core, this problem persists across all of the metadata that you might be um, storing in your repositories. Um, all right, that was a lot. <laughs> so, so what we're doing um, is what we started doing was take, taking a look at data models for how to express um, this local or regional name authority data, take a look at some of the open source tools um, that could be used um, for storing this data. We have a pilot Im implementation and then we're currently in an assessment phase uh, right now. So um, as, as we've seen, which is a theme um, really throughout this day, um, you can't go it alone and this has to come down to libraries working together. So we had a variety of contributions, um, many of them from people in this room. I think the only non-MWDL partner that we were working with was the University of Denver. Um, but we want to thank um, all of the people that allowed us to, to wrangle their, their data and, and use it in the pilot project. Um, so some of these things that where we were getting um, data from, we had um, Oregon Digital gave us their information. We were using... Um, a lot of the leaning on some of the partner data that we had in our SOFAL instance, um, as well as getting um, information from BYU and USU, and those were some of our major partners on this. So um, one of the things that we were doing with all of our partners was trying to figure out um, what kind of data model um, we wanted to use, and we ended up with something more from the archives world. So if you speak EAD or finding aid, um, you might be more, you, 
you might be more familiar with um, EAC CPF, which stands for Encoded Archival Content, Corporate Bodies, Persons, and Families, um, which is a really um, interesting standard. And the reason why we chose it is because so many of our digital library materials are drawn from special collections. So when we thought about what we wanted to, the information that we wanted to capture about these names, we really also wanted the context about the digital collection they were in, um, eventually be able to express relationship information so we can get a sense also of families whose um, collections might be dispersed among different libraries, for example. And we wanted to explore the intersection between those um, collections as well. Um, if you haven't heard of it, I encourage you to check out um, the SNAC project. Um, Gina mentioned this, so um, Utah State Archives and BYU are official SNAC partners. Um, and that's a project that's gotten really a lot of uh, grant funding to be able to display these network graphs of the people that are in special collections. Um, and we are not even close to that. We're like a tiny, tiny, like little teeny baby version, maybe. Um, but we have had some conversations with the SNAC people and also contributed some use cases to them. Um, and we're interested in, in kind of exploring that potential co connection in the future. So um, we had to do a lot of metadata wrangling and metadata transformation <laughs> as part of this. Um, so we, we got the data for this project in a variety of formats. And you'll see here some of that came in the form of uh, structured lists. Some of it came in the form of full content DM collection exports. Um, we had some JSON, which was great. Um, and, and some things we got kind of with some additional um, information, and we needed to parse through that. And by we, I mean Jeremy parsed through it all. Um, <laughs> So one of the things that we did was, that Jeremy did, um, was deduplicated um, the metadata. So when we first had a list of names, we had around half a million. And there were so many duplicates in that, we got it down to around um, 76,000 names. So that was sort of a tremendous feat in and of itself. Um, talk to Jeremy about his wizardry with Excel formulas, if you want to hear about the details of that. Um, the other thing that we did was we also had a student worker who was able to um, take this stripped down database of names and did some um, reconciliation work with OpenRefine. And so um, we did find a lot of bad matches because some of our names really were like hyperlocal or they were so general you can't like assume that a John Smith in Utah is whatever random John Smith um, that Open Refine was pointing you to at the Library of Congress um, without some additional investigation. So another thing that Jeremy has been working on is um, thinking about NACO work. Um, not everyone has the resources to contribute to NACO. Um, one of the, the comments that we sometimes got back when we did presentations were like, well, why are you even doing this? Put all your names in NACO. Um, and that's not necessarily practical for everyone um, that, that doesn't have a large staff of catalogers trained in that work. Um, but we were able to identify some workflows to update NACO or enhance existing records um, with a little bit more nimbleness. For example, we looked through our database and found um, people that were over 100 years old who didn't have a death date um, in, in NACO. And put together a workflow where we had a student worker do some of the preliminary research necessary to figure out who was actually dead, and then um, get all that data together and then see about updating those records. So this has become a little bit of a larger portion of the, wor the workflow than we originally imagined, but I think some of these lightweight ways that we're using um, student workers to help out with this NACO work um, might be of interest to other um, institutions who maybe don't have the time um, to, or, or the staff to do full research um, for NACO names like this. Um, that's about it on NACO. That should have been on the bingo card. <laughs> um, 
So this is a quick look at some of the open source um, systems that we were looking at. One of the things that hampered us was um, we did want to use EAC CPF. It is very complex. A lot of the existing open source um, off-the-shelf tools that you can use to store names are really much more thesaurus based. So we wanted to get more granular and complex in the kind of information we wanted to capture because that is what um, metadata people usually do. They're like, let's make this as complex and specific as we possibly can. <laughs> um, so if, if we had wanted to do more of a simple list of names, um, some of these open source um, products that are out there would have been fine, but being that we were kind of aiming to, to this EAC CPF standard, even like a tiny smidgen of EAC CPF, um, made it a little bit more complex. Um, at one point, we were going to go with collective access, which has um, really supports um, custom vocabularies in the back end. But then we realized we'd have to figure out what on earth to do for like a front end discovery layer. And at the same time, we were working on this digital exhibits program that I've talked about far too much um, in Omeka S. And we realized that it really had um, all of the features that we were looking for for the pilot. So um, some of the things that Omeka S has um, is support for custom vocabularies. If you have like a RDF ontology ALF file, um, you can, you can sl slurp in custom vocabularies. And we were able to get in um, all of EAC CPF in there, even though that's overkill, because we're really using like like, I don't know, 12 fields out of 300 or something like that. It's a lot. Um, but it also has an API, a RESTful API built in. Um, we were hoping to use that for reconciliation. It publishes data as JSON-LD. Um, so it's not true linked data in the sense of um, having a triple store, but, um, but having it as JSON-LD is like a kind of a decent intermediate step for us as a pilot project. It also has a search and discovery layer and editing functionality as well. So that's what we went with. Um, we've uploaded um, our records in the Western Name Authority file database to it. Um, here's an example sample record where we can kind of see here, um, we have a local ID number for every item. Um, and we're also linking out to different collections um, where that person um, is referred to. This is a record where we've got um, folks from both BYU and University of Utah ha happen to have people um, with Lucy Woodruff Smith in their collections. Um, so yeah, pilot implementation for Omeka. We've got over 60,000 names into Omeka S. That was basically uploading a lot of CSV files in sequence, um, and it, it worked pretty well. Um, we have student workers to work on reconciliation, data entry, enrichment. Um, the amount of manual work it takes to put something like this together should really not be underestimated. Um, and so some of the things that we're looking at right now are what are, what are our collaborative workflows going to be? Um, I've tried to see if I can reconcile against the Omeka site with OpenRefine and run into some problems. Um, so I'm, gonna, I'm going to work on a way that people might be able to locally reconcile um, some of their information against this data set, and that'll hopefully be good enough for a pilot project. It's, it's what we're going to get, basically, anyway. Um, one of the things that we're also doing for assessment um, is to get a sense of what's the before and after, like what's, what's the impact of this, how can we measure the impact of this moving forward. Um, so one of the things that we did at, at an early stage of the project was we had a developer whip up um, a simple script that queries um, the DPLA API for name representations. This is before the project um, happened and before our data was reharvested by MWDL. So you can see here there's really, there's a ton of Charles Savage name variants. A lot of it's coming from MWDL, but a lot of those variants are also from like DPLA at large too. So seeing the intersection between those metrics is, is really kind of interesting. It's not just the MWDL network that had so many variants. It's also happening, you know, maybe at a national level as well. Um, and I need to actually run the script again now, and hopefully we'll see some of those numbers coalesce a little bit more. 
Um, and we plan on, tra on tracking these changes um, over time as hopefully our usage of this encourages um, both people in our library and partners or people in the West in general um, to become more specific with the names that they're using. So looking forward, um, these are some of the questions that we're asking ourselves right now. What would we need for full implementation? Um, I think we would need to put in for a bigger grant with more development support so we could get like a real triple store behind it um, and that would be interesting. Um, another thing is just how, how, does something, how could something like this be leveraged for other DPLA service hubs? I know I've talked to other folks who contribute content to DPLA and um, having more accurate name information is also something that's been on the mind for, for other people um, who are doing this kind of work. Um, and another thing that we're thinking of doing is um, taking a look at what other digital libraries are doing with name authority in their co collections and seeing maybe where some of the gaps are. Um, Jeremy and I were involved with a uh, project, was it the shareable name authority, something or other, um, run out of um, Cornell. Um, it was another IMLS grant and it released a white paper recently with issues on authority control but um, it was still sort of very much framing things in terms of bibliographic authority control, and I think that there are some issues with authority control as it exists in digital libraries where we have a lot of people, a lot of them are not writing books, but we still need to, to represent their information um, and sometimes leaning too heavily on the practices for bibliographic authority control uh, can create some issues for those of us in digital libraries that need to be like more fast and nimble um, in our approach to metadata. So that's where we are um, right now and uh, thanks very much. And we have a project website up. Um, we have the site itself is up on our exhibits platform and um, we'll be wrapping up the grant in the next few months and I'm sure you'll be hearing more from us about it. So thanks a lot.